This is Wrestling with Wrestling's Past and Present. I'm Tim Kurt. And I'm Roland Fulis. And today is episode three, which is part two of our Chris Jericho discussion. And so just kind of to uh, review where we left things off with Chris Jericho in the past last week, um, we started talking about his feud with uh, CM Punk. He kind of had a squash match where Fandango beat him rather quickly. It was an uneventful match at WrestleMania 29. Uh, And then the following month, he ended up beating Fandango to kind of end that feud. And that was really the last we heard of him. Yeah, so that's where we're going to start today's episode uh, in the present. Um, Like he said, about an 11-month break for Chris Jericho. He finally returns to Raw back on June 30th of 2014 where he attacked the Miss, who also returned uh, that same day. Um, And then he ultimately got attacked by the Wyatt family, which led to a feud with Bray Wyatt. It's a good way to bring him back. Uh, You know, Wyatt was somewhat white-hot with the the Wyatt family kind of uh, cult-like following vibe that he had. So it it put Jericho in a good light right off the bat. Absolutely. Uh, So he would face uh, Bray Wyatt at Battleground, and he would win uh, that match. Um, he would also face, uh, Bray Wyatt at SummerSlam, but that time he lost, uh, to, to Wyatt. Which is probably Bray Wyatt's, like, only win on pay-per-view in that, that era. I remember it seemed like, and I, we're going a little off topic here, but it seemed like Bray Wyatt, like, never won on pay-per-view ever. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Like, the first episode we talked about Charlotte Flair, you know, not, not losing on pay-per-view, but Bray Wyatt never seemed to win on (laughs) pay-per-view. Um, and then he would face Bray Wyatt one more time on an episode of Raw back in, in September in a steel cage match. This would be the blow-off match to end their feud. Um, I think there was a big bump off the top of the cage, if I remember correctly, during that match. And then he would uh, switch gears a little bit and enter into a feud with uh, Randy Orton, um who apparently Randy Orton attacked him uh, prior to his match um, on that Raw. That's kind of how they transitioned Jericho from a uh, Wyatt feud to a Randy Orton feud. Randy Orton probably one of the more underrated guys, too. I mean, he's been around for what seems like forever. So, again, you're, you're not putting Jericho on the back burner, but you're not having him challenge for you know a, a big title, but at least you're still keeping him pretty relevant. So they, they had a good idea of bringing him back and having him do programs with Wyatt and Orton here. And I think uh, it makes for good TV when you have characters that are already established – you know, fighting somebody that is coming back to the company that might even be a bigger name in, in the case of Jericho versus Wyatt. But, I mean, Jericho and Orton together, two well-known wrestlers who can go, who can have a good match, you know, together or apart. So I think it was a good transition. Uh, so that feud would ultimately culminate in a match at Night of Champions, which Orton would win. Uh, and then Jericho, for a little while, would not wrestle on television, but only wrestle at live events, uh, mainly defeating Bray Wyatt at those events. Yeah, for October and November, he was pretty much a uh, live event only person, for some reason. He would then uh, make an appearance, though, in December as a guest general manager of Raw back on December 15th. And he actually, this is kind of interesting, he booked himself in a street fight against Paul Heyman in the main event of that episode of Raw, but that, as you might guess, led to the return of Brock Lesnar, and Lesnar attacked Jericho before the match with Heyman could ever uh, take place. Saving saving his, uh, advocate, his advocate from, from sheer doom. <laughs> By the way, I, I'm a big Paul Heyman fan. I think he still does the, probably the best promo in the business today, uh, just as a side note there. I, I definitely agree with that. He, um... I think when you think of creative minds in the business, he has to be at the top of the list. Yeah. Hands down. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Let's see here. Um, So then, you know, where we we start off in 2015, and again, um, he's mostly doing the house show thing. His contract uh, with the WWE at the time is just for 16 house shows only. Uh, He would wrestle against... People like Kevin Owens, um, Luke Harper, King Barrett. That's a name that uh, we haven't talked about uh, during the show. Uh, Usually coming out on the winning side during those matches. And King Barrett, uh, you know, being the former Nexus leader, uh, he actually is just in the news recently for filling in for Jim Cornette um, after the NWA shows, uh, the syndicated shows, um, studio shows, rather. Uh, They they got rid of... Jim Cornette, because he made some controversial uh, comments, and 
Wade Barrett, uh, Stu Bennett, is now taking over his place as the color guy, ironically enough. Let's see. And Luke Harper's actually been in the news a little bit, too. Uh, yep. There's rumors that he's not happy with this current situation with WWE. And uh, I think he trademarked his name. Um, and he's, I think he's looking for a way out of WWE right now. So, Well, he asked for his release. And because he was injured, WWE said no. And they actually tacked more time onto his current contract. So his contract's actually over. But the WWE is pretty much holding him at gunpoint, saying, nope, you owe us dates because you were injured. And uh, I think they're just trying to prevent him from going to, like, AEW or a Ring of Honor right now. Uh, but, yeah, how can you be happy with, you know, he's a guy that, again, getting a little off topic, but he's a guy that can wrestle, and they just they have nothing for him. No, nope. It's embarrassing if, if it's WWE because Harper is a, a very agile big man. Yeah, he's, he's definitely a good worker. Uh, so in May of 2015, Jericho would actually be one of the hosts of the – uh, return of Tough Enough, uh, that reality show that WWE did for a while there. And he would make his return to uh, television uh, at the Beast in the special where he would defeat Neville. That was a special event um, in Japan, I believe. A WWE Network special in Japan. Uh, so Jericho returned there. Neville being Hawk in AEW now. Yep. Um, it, it's funny to see some of the names and how they cross over. You know, this was five years ago almost, you know, four and a half, and, you know, they're relevant now. Yeah, they're still relevant today yeah. in AEW. Uh, he would return to uh, pay-per-view Night of Champions, where he would be the mystery partner of Roman Reigns and Dean Ambrose, where they would face the Wyatt family. Uh, they would end up losing that match. And then, uh, scrolling into October here, uh, Jericho faced Kevin Owens for the Intercontinental title, um, at Madison Square Garden, which he would lose as well. That match with Kevin Owens marked Chris Jericho's 20-year anniversary, uh, starting with, with debuting with ACW and 25th year in the business. So put that into perspective, being in 2016, he's already got 25 years in the yeah. business. So now you, you fast forward to where we are today, he's coming up on his 30th year of professional wrestling. And that's kind of remarkable because I don't think of Chris Jericho as an old guy. <laughs> no, I think, um, I mean, he's never really been in, like, the best of shape. He's never been, like, no. a, a stud by any means. But he's always, he's kind of like a Ric Flair. You know, when Ric Flair was younger and in the business, he was never cut or really strong. But he was in ring shape. And, mm -hmm. and that's what you had to be to be able to, you know, perform up and down the road. And Jericho's always been one of those guys. I mean, yeah, he's got some muscle to him, but he's not really. I mean, people are kind of knocking him now because he looks, looks a little pudgy. And it's like he's almost 50. Like, what do, you, what do you expect out of the guy? I, I can't, I could be wrong about this, but I can't remember him ever having, like, a major injury where he was out for a long period of time due to an injury. Yeah, I think he's been able to avoid the injury bug, you know, having something broken or, or something major. You know, you know, everybody gets banged up. Yeah. But, yeah, I don't remember any, any hiatus he's had usually been for him to go off and do other projects or just take a mental break or whatever. But, yeah, I can't remember him, you know, I mean, Look at names like Triple H. Every time he would go away, when he was, he'd blow a quad, or you know, there'd be there'd be something going on. Sure. Um, so he would return to full uh, to full time um, competition in January of 2016. He had a confrontation with the New Day, uh, and then he would enter the 2016 Royal Rumble. He entered at number six. Uh, lasted just under an hour. He was eliminated by Dean Ambrose. Um, that was the Royal Rumble that marked the debut of AJ Styles in WWE. Probably one of the biggest names at that point to never have been in the WWE in a prominent role. I mean, back before TNA started, he had a tryout with the WWE and lasted there for a little while, but they didn't see anything in him. And you fast forward, you know, almost 20 years later, and, you know, AJ Styles is one of the biggest names in the company now. Yes, absolutely. And he would have been in late 30, mid Mid to late 30s right there. I think about 37. I think he's about 42 right now. Yeah. Uh, so he would enter into a program with AJ Styles. Um, the first match uh, in on January 25th episode of Raw, Jericho would lose to Styles. Um, and then he would return the favor, though, on SmackDown in February where he would defeat Styles. And then in the third match between the two, uh, Styles won at Fastlane. Um, and then after that match, so they ended up becoming a tag team. And I actually kind of liked their tag team name, Y2AJ. I thought that was kind of clever. Um, it kind of had the same feeling of, like, 
just throwing two guys together originally. But it actually yeah. wasn't bad. I mean, it didn't last very long. But I, I thought, you know, they were two good workers. It had potential, but I didn't know where they were going with it. Yeah, it didn't really last long. Uh, probably just about a month or so. Uh, Jericho would end up turning heel by attacking AJ Styles after they lost the New Day um, on an episode of Raw in March. Um, and he would claim, and the reason for that uh, turn was that he was sick of the fans uh, cheering for Styles instead of him. Uh, so he kind of began uh, a feud run there, and they would end up uh, facing each other at WrestleMania 32. And obviously that's probably why they couldn't have a really long program, because they were running out of time to have that match at WrestleMania. WrestleMania sure. So they're already in February at that point, so it had to be quick. But I, I kind of wonder what it could have been. You know, it could have been something where it lasted a little bit of a while and they got more traction out of it, but they didn't want to miss WrestleMania. I could see them if they, yeah, if they had more time, I could even see them having a run as the uh, tag team champions there for a while before yep. the turn happened. But I agree. Um, obviously, time was of the essence, and that wasn't able to, uh, to take place. Um, at WrestleMania, by the way, Jericho would defeat uh, Styles. Um, which I think that was a little surprising to me. I thought, you know, you might expect Styles to get over that match being the face and everything. So I thought it was, I, and I kind of like it when they do unexpected finishes like that. So I actually kind of enjoy that they actually made Jericho get over at WrestleMania. And that being AJ Styles' first WrestleMania, you kind of had to figure that it was going to be AJ winning too. You, yeah, you know, that's oh, they're going to they're put him over. You know, he's going to have his WrestleMania moment finally after all this time and kudos to them for not going the way probably 80 to 90 percent of the people thought it would go so moving right along here uh we're focusing on an episode of raw in on april 4th uh 2016 uh jericho would uh compete in a fatal four-way match against styles kevin owens and cesaro this was for the number one contendership of the world heavyweight title um he w would end up being pinned by Styles, and that kind of was the end of their feud after that episode of Raw. Then the following week, Jericho is hosting his talk show, The Highlight Reel, and was interrupted by Dean Ambrose, who replaced the show uh, with the Ambrose Asylum after having uh, by showing um, Jericho a note from Shane McMahon, and that kind of started a feud be uh, between those two. And this is kind of... Um, where Jericho kind of changed up his gimmick a little bit. He began wearing uh, the scarves. He was wearing the light-up jacket at the time. Um, and this is where he started calling uh, everybody stupid idiots. I kind of like this version of Jericho. Um, with... Yeah, he was kind of a childish, snobby, you know, stuck-up, kind of arrogant heel character where, like, you like to hate him. Like, that was his gimmick. He, he wanted to do stuff, like, so over the top as, like, look at me, I'm a bad guy, that it made people go, wow, like... This guy, we, we hate him. We want to hate him. But but they still liked him enough to listen and wait for people to call him, you know, for him to call people stupid idiots. Yeah. <laughs> so it was like a heel, but like, it was kind of like an Austin type heel where like people, like the what chance and stuff like that, I think, where, you know, people knew it was coming. They were just waiting for it. Absolutely. Uh, Jericho would lose to Dean Ambrose, uh, Don Moxley now, at Payback. And this was also the time that Ambrose actually destroyed Jericho's light up jacket. Maybe that's why they went away from him. Maybe that was the last one he had. Maybe Light Bright stopped making them, and, <laughs> and he couldn't get them, so he's like, well, I'm just going to wear a scarf, damn it. And that's how it went. But I, I don't know what happened there. But uh, Let's see here. Uh, at Extreme Rules, uh, Ambrose again defeated Jericho in an asylum match. Uh, Jericho um, was thrown on a pile of thumbtacks. So they're bringing back the thumbtack spot from 1998. <laughs> the Mick Foley spot. Yes. Uh, at Money in the Bank, Jericho was in the Money in the Bank ladder match. Uh, he qualified by defeating Apollo Crews, but the match was ultimately won by Ambrose. Let's see. Uh, now, that was at the end of May that year of 2016. Yes. Uh, now we're entering the summertime of 2016. Uh, they had a, a draft in July, which Jericho had drafted to the Raw brand. He would eventually end up competing in a fatal four-way match for the uh, number one contendership for the new Universal Championship at the time, um, but he did not win. Roman Reigns ended up winning that match. And the Universal Championship, again, for people that are loosely associated with it, was pretty much Raw's answer to not having a champion because the WWE champion at the time was drafted to SmackDown, which was Dean Ambrose. Just as a side note, I've always hated the two champions thing. I, I think yeah. there should be one champion that competes on both shows. 
I, I'm fine with the Intercontinental being on one show and the U.S. title being on another show, but I think there should be one heavyweight champion and one tag team champion. Um, I just, I've always hated the idea there's two champions because you don't really, at that point, you don't really know who's the best. Yeah, you have a champion per show, and, it, you know, if you, you know, my thing too, if you want to have separate tag team champions, I guess, for shows, it's not so bad because there's so many tag teams, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, having one belt per the whole, uh, the whole thing versus having one on each show. It kind of waters it down a little, too. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. Jericho would um, begin a feud with Enzo and Cass. Uh, that's another name we haven't talked about um, on the show yet. What might have been. I know, I know. Um, this this is happening in August, and let's see here. And this is back when Enzo and Cass were like over, over so far over that you know they'd come out and, and Enzo would do his shtick, and the fans would be right there with it, and you know they'd be they'd be saying the words for him. So they yeah, again they're they're putting Jericho, they're not putting him on the back burner, they're still putting him with people that are over and probably trying to elevate them a little bit at the time too, because they they believe they backed Enzo and Cass and wanted them to be something so. It felt like it wasn't... It was kind of a a weird transition, but it makes sense looking back on it now. So it was at this time, though, that he began his alliance with Kevin Owens, and uh, Chris Jericho and Kevin Owens ended up facing Enzo and Cass in a tag team match at SummerSlam, uh, and they would be successful and win that match. A little side note to this, too. I actually uh, recently listened to an interview uh, from Chris Jericho, that said his contract was going to end at that time just before WrestleMania. His original idea was for Vince McMahon. He had talked to Vince, and he wanted to have Shinsuke Nakamura brought up to the main roster to face him at WrestleMania. And then uh, McMahon was kind of torn on the idea of it, and then he mentioned Kevin Owens. And they started this, this uh, alliance together, and they didn't know... Vince still wasn't sold on that being a match for WrestleMania either. He wanted to have a blow-off before that, but this turned into something so good that he actually, they changed the, the plan of where they were, the direction of where they were going by how good Kevin and, and Chris made this. Because Vince didn't really have high hopes for this either. And I know we're just starting to touch on it, but this becomes something really good for that period of time. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. It was one of the probably more entertaining mm-hmm. um, angles that they had going at that time. Uh, so he would, you know, obviously, typical uh, being the heel team, uh, interfere in Owens' matches to help him win. This kind of starts against a match with Neville, which allowed Owens to qualify for the Fatal 4 match for the new Universal Championship, which he ultimately won, that being Kevin Owens. On September 19th episode of Raw, he Chris Jericho cut a promo against General Manager Mick Foley, and this is the first, uh, or I should say it's the introduction of the List of Jericho. Uh, the List of Jericho started off as a list of grievances against Mick Foley, but it turned out to just anybody that basically annoyed Chris Jericho. Um, during this promo, you had a bunch of tag teams come out. You had the New Day. You had the Shining Stars. That's the name of uh, where are they now. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the Los Matadores yes. at one point. You had um, Gallows and Anderson, uh, New Day. So they all began to interrupt Chris Jericho. And he would um, start, he put everybody um, on the list that interrupted him because yeah, they he, annoyed him. He turned it into a list of stupid idiots, is what he said yeah, so in the promo. Is... He goes, this, you know, this was a Mick Foley list, now it's just a list of stupid idiots. And he put them all on the list. <laughs> and this uh, became a really popular angle with the fans. I certainly enjoyed it. Well, and it was funny, too, because Kevin Owens and Chris Jericho had that kind of comedic friendship where the idea for, um, you know, getting the, the stupid idiot and then getting words over, like Jericho actually said, he actually bet Kevin that he could get the word it over. And he did. And he did. Oh, and he had his shoulders <laughs> over. People, you know, because there was a promo where he said that to Kevin Owens. Jericho said, you know, you're going to get it. And Owens went, what? And he just said, it. And it became this giant thing, like, and Jericho more or less became like a a friendly wager of like, I bet you I get the word it over, and he succeeded hands down. So uh, fast forward a little bit to Class of Champions in September, uh, Jericho would defeat uh, Sami Zayn, and he would also help Owens uh, pick up a victory against Seth Rollins. 
And uh, again, Jericho would help out Owens again back at Hell in the Cell. Um, he helped Owens again defeat uh, Rollins. Uh, at Survivor Series that year, uh, Jericho and Owens would team with Roman Reigns, Seth Rollins, and Braun Strowman as part of Team Raw. However, they would lose to SmackDown on that night. I don't even remember who was on that SmackDown team, but how mean, do you beat that Raw team? I know. I mean, <laughs> think of the names on that list. Chris Jericho would, um, you know, after that Survivor Series match, he would go back to helping out Kevin Owens. He would help Owens again defeat Rollins, uh, this time showing up in a Sin Cara mask, uh, which is kind of cool. But now we kind of, the following week, we kind of see that things are starting to break down between the two. Um, they're starting to say that they don't need each other anymore. Um, so you kind of, that's kind of the first sign of tension uh, yeah. between Jericho and Owen. Yeah, building the tension. The, uh, the typical WWE uh, swerve, you think, like, oh, they're going to show the tension and then they're going to keep them together, and, which they did for a little while. They teased it for a bit. And you just didn't know which way they were going to go with it, whether they were going to stay together, pull them apart. It, it was it was an odd kind of lull in there, you know, which direction are they going. Sure. Um, then we get to Roadblock, end of the line, which I think is a stupid pay-per-view name, but that's <laughs> neither here nor there. <laughs> um, it's almost like they had to fit a pay-per-view in real quick, and they're like, what are we going to name this thing? I know. We're going to name it Great Balls of Fire. <laughs> like, you know, they just come oh, up that's with, the worst yeah, they, of all time. They, they, they come up with some dumb, uh, some dumb names just to fill holes, you know? Oh, man. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> Jericho would lose to Seth Rollins um, after Kevin Owens was unsuccessful in trying to help him win. Later that night, though, Owens was facing Roman Reigns for the title. And he actually, Jericho actually attacked Owens uh, to get Roman Reigns disqualified. But it's kind of interesting that he actually phys was physical with Owens at that point. And I think if I remember correctly, too, when that happened, everybody thought that was the blow up to, to the friendship. And then afterwards in the ring, they ended up hugging and, and things were good. Yeah. But you can still, there's, there are yeah, kind of foreshadowing some yep. tension there. Then they would. Um, Jericho and Owens would enter into this program with Roman Reigns for the United States title, which would ultimately end by uh, a handicap match between Kevin Owens and Chris Jericho facing Roman Reigns. Uh, Jericho pinned Reigns uh, in that handicap match, and he would become uh, the United States championship. Uh, a side note here, this was his first championship in almost seven years with the company, which uh, in my research I thought it was kind of um, That is a pretty to, big gap. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that also made him a Grand Slam champion. Uh, winning all the titles in, in the company. That was the only one he hadn't won. So then at the Royal Rumble, there was a match between Reigns and Kevin Owens, um, and Jericho was suspended in a shark cage above the ring. Uh, I thought that was really funny, um, and just how he was be being such a crybaby about it, being afraid of heights and everything. The, the, the way that he um, acted that, during that storyline was priceless to me. Yeah, he kept up with the childish heel, you know, yes. throw, throwing a hissy fit, like, you know, like a, a baby, you know, on the floor, you know, a toddler getting a tantrum before, you know, we're not getting their way. So, yeah, very heelish and very uh, Jericho-ish at the time. The, the character, it fit so well. Jericho would later um, compete in the uh, Royal Rumble match, lasted over an hour, and after that he began calling himself, I believe, the 61-minute man. Yeah. Um, which is comical because you think about the Royal Rumble before that. He was in there for almost an hour almost then, Almost an hour, too. So, I mean, then, yeah. he's now had a couple performances where he's been in the Royal Rumble for almost hours put together, which is insane. Uh, so then, on February 13th, there was the Festival of Friendship for Kevin Owens in Las Vegas. Uh, I actually just watched this back before, or actually we both did, before we um, started recording this, and I just... That was really an entertaining uh, skit, the Festival of Friendship. Well, and I feel like it was, you know, meant to be Jericho's saving the friendship type thing, where, like, they knew they were there on the rocks. They, it was Jericho's, like, I just, I'm going to show you how much you mean to me. And he would he would give them uh, Ralph Guggenheim, uh, $7,000 uh, statue. Uh, sculpture, yeah. So then you have Chris Jericho presents Kevin Owens with a painting. They're both in their wrestling gear, and their championship belts are on, and they're reaching for each other, almost touching fingers. 
and Chris Jericho implied that Kevin Owens could hang it in his house. And Kevin Owens looks at him and goes, I have a family. I have young kids. I can't hang this thing in my house. Which then Jericho has the famous line of, it's art. You don't need pants. <laughs> which which was hilarious. Just the way that it was said and the way the, the face that Jericho had made, made that segment so hilarious. Oh, I love that. It was a really cool segment. You, you honestly didn't know they were going to cut it. You know, the, the idea, I guess, was supposedly that they were going to bring Goldberg out, who Kevin Owens had to face uh, off against for the, to defend his Universal Championship. So that was the, the gimmick was to try to get Goldberg to come out so they could beat him up. And Jericho ends up having Gilbert come mm-hmm. out. And, uh, you know, Owen, you could tell Owens was not happy with it. And uh, ends up beating up Gilberg and then kind of saying, you know, Jericho, what is this? Like, the, you know, this wasn't what it's supposed to be. You know, Owens then does the, the okay, I'm sorry. Like, this is great. You know, you're I have a gift for you. And he ends up giving Kevin Owens or giving Chris Jericho a, a gift from him. He said it wasn't much. It's all, you know, he didn't think it was going to be this big deal. And he gives him the gift. And the gift was... Well, we thought it was a new list to Jericho, Mm -hmm. but Chris Jericho noticed that his name was on the list, and he turns it around, and it's the list of KO, and there it is, friendship over, Kevin Owens attacks Jericho uh, and beats him up pretty good. I wonder where that painting ended up. Is it in the warehouse? It it probably is. Where's the Guggenheim? That needs to be in the Smithsonian or something. (laughs) Um, Yeah, that, that was just a funny, funny skit. Um, but it was also a, 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 a nice way to transition into the feud between the two. Um, so Jericho was off TV for a couple weeks. He returned at Fastlane, which was when Kevin Owens was going to face Goldberg. He distracted Kevin Owens, and Goldberg ended up winning the title in one of the classic Goldberg swap matches. A two, yeah, I mean, like a two move and done match. Like Goldberg even needed the help, you know? No, they were already booking it to be a squash to begin with. Yeah. Um. So this ended up. Uh, leading to a match at WrestleMania 33 between Jericho and Owens uh, for the U.S. title, which Owens would win and win the title in the process. Um, so then after uh, WrestleMania, um, they would swap the title back and forth. Jericho would defeat Owens at payback uh, for the title, but would lose it back to him a couple nights later on SmackDown. Uh, following that match, though, Owens attacked Jericho. Jericho was carried out on a stretcher. This was to write Jericho off. Um, so he could, um, you know, do his thing with Fozzie. And that was really the end of Jericho in WWE, really. He had a couple yeah. of, uh, you know, just one-off appearances later on in the year. Yeah, he would um, come back in July. He would uh, wrestle on a SmackDown um, in a triple threat match against uh, Kevin Owens and AJ Styles. Uh, but he would lose um, that match when he was pinned by Styles. He would make into, an appearance on the 25th anniversary of Raw in January 2018. Which it's funny because the way this dates, that 25th anniversary was after they had already had the um, Jericho in New Japan starting the thing with Kenny Omega. Yes. So they kind of overlap, which was weird. You didn't think you were going to see Jericho there. And he didn't wrestle. He just showed up. He was backstage. He did a backstage But segment. still, it was weird that you felt like the friend, the, the business relationship with WWE was over. And he mm-hmm. still was showed up and while it was still intertwined with the, the Kenny Omega New Japan stuff. And his last appearance to date with the WWE was at the Greatest Royal Rumble match. Um, he would enter at number 50, um, but he was eventually eliminated by Braun Strowman in the match. And that's it. That's the end of Jericho's <laughs> career uh, yeah. as of right now. So Jericho would stay active, though, in wrestling. Um, like you said, he had that feud with Kenny Omega in New Japan. Uh, he would end up losing to Kenny Omega. Uh, at that match, the the Alpha versus Omega feud, which was at, pretty much at that time, Omega was white hot in the indie scene, essentially. And, and I know New Japan's not really indie, but for the fans stateside, it was it was a cult following here. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Kenny Omega was the guy. Yeah, he. I mean, he's regarded as one of the best wrestlers in the world today, mm-hmm. and you know, back then, and you know, still today. He, you know, he would become the IWGP Intercontinental Title. Um, by defeating uh, Tetsuya Nato. I hope I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> um, again, that's back in uh, May of 20, around early 2018 there. Yeah, I, I think that the New Japan relationship is what led to him going to AEW. 
I think it, it created, um, you know, an in with, with uh, the Young Bucks and, and Cody Rhodes, the elite, as they would be called, you know, with Kenny Omega and stuff. And I think that's what led to him signing ultimately with the AEW, who, when they made the announcement, it was a huge announcement. Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, that, that was big because um, AEW, at that time, you didn't know how it was going to take off. You didn't know if it's going to be successful or not. But what a big coup for the company to sign a megastar like Chris Jericho. And that was the beginning of 2019 in January. He, they had, the AEW had a, uh, he had a media event, and, and he made the surprise appearance at the media event saying that, you know, here I am. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm the guy, get on my back. You know, I'm the big name that's going to lead AEW to fame and fortune. And that, you know, he, that, that was his whole thing too, ever since being in AEW. He still wants to thank you. Yes. For that, for coming here, for saving them, for being the guy, yep. and that was what started all that. And that was back, like I said, January eighth of twenty nineteen, so almost almost a year ago now, when he had that famous media event appearance. Sure. So then you go into May, where AEW had Double or Nothing, one of their first big pay per views. Uh, Jericho would defeat Kenny Omega, and then he would go on to defeat Adam Page at All Out to become the first ever. AEW World Champion and the the Kenny Omega match that match was determined who was going to face the winner of the Battle Royal who was pa- Adam, who was Adam, Adam Page, Page yes. so they, they they had the Casino Battle Royale which which led to the one man coming out of that and then the winner of the Omega Jericho match was going to get, fight for the the inaugural championship for AEW. Just as a side note, that Double or Nothing pay per view was awesome. Uh, two match. If you ever have the opportunity to go back and watch that, uh, hopefully they release it on uh, video at some point. Um, two matches that were my favorite of the night was the Kenny Omega Chris Jericho match, uh, but also the brothers match between Cody and Dustin Rhodes. That match, uh, you know, if you don't mind blood, go and watch that match because that was probably my favorite match of the year so far. And the story that was told too the, oh. of of Cody being the the forgotten son, essentially, um, you know, where Dustin was famous for being Dusty Rhodes' son. He was the natural. He was. The story behind that was great. Again, a little bit off topic, but yeah, it hands down had to be one of the top matches Absolutely. of the year. So then um, AEW uh, has their weekly show Dynamite now, and Jericho has created a faction called the Inner Circle with Sammy Guevara, Santana and Ortiz, and Jake Hagar, the former Jack Swagger in WWE. We the People yes. is dead, in case you're wondering. <laughs> it, was a, it was a stupid... Uh, a stupid thing by uh, bad writing, according to Chris Jericho. According to Chris Jericho, <laughs> yes. Um, so Jericho in AEW, he's had, he's had set matches with guys like Darby Allen. Um, he had a, a big match against Cody at full gear at the Full Gear pay per view, um, which kind of ended in controversy when MJF threw in the towel uh, on behalf of Cody Rhodes. And yeah, to this, to then make it so Cody could never challenge for the title for the title again. Yeah. Uh, he had a match against Scorpio Sky. Uh, for the title, which took place because there was a tag team match between SCU, SCU, yeah, and Jericho and Guevara, but um, and Sky pinned Jericho in that tag team match, and that kind of set up the uh, title match. So uh, he he's going on this thing where he has he's calling himself Le Champion. <laughs> now again, just another way of reinventing himself. And it's it's funny too because the the most recent AEW show they brought back the list of Jericho, which is now. The lexicon of Le Champion, yes. which is literally just a list of Jericho, just, yeah. and he did the exact same thing. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> and he did the exact same thing. It was this time it was a list of people he wouldn't face for the championship because he has one more defense to make before the end of the year. And it was funny because it was it goes right back to the the, the D Malenko promo where like every <laughs> every third hold was armbar. Yep, every third person was Moxley, was Moxley. which is hilarious. Um, but Jericho's always found a way to keep himself relevant. I think that's the biggest thing about the whole career of Chris Jericho to kind of end this episode and, and, and put a, uh, a cherry on top of this Sunday for him is that no matter what he's done, he's always been able to keep it fresh, different. People were always interested in what he was going to say and do. And that's what makes Chris Jericho probably the most, I would say, versatile and entertaining sports entertainer slash wrestler of the last, what, 20 years? I, I would completely agree with that. And he got everything over. Whether he was a heel or a face, he got over. He got a bottle of champagne over now in AEW, where they're actually selling a little bit of the bubbly. Yeah, uh, he got the word "it" over. He got the word "it" over in <laughs> so, WWE. I mean, that's so, literally straight out of what Stone Cold would do to get yeah. the word "what" over. Jericho got the word "it" over. It's insane. 
And so it, it, it's, you know, and he's still going on today. He's not even close to slowing down. You know, if you, you, you we go back to our episode last week, you know, we started off in 96, and he actually started his career before that, but we started in 96. Um, and now we're in 2019 going into 2020, and he's still going strong, and he's relevant, and he's the champion. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, I think this was certainly the right person to pick if we're going to pick one um, – wrestler to do a past and present profile on i think there's nobody better than chris jericho well and he reportedly signed a three-year deal with aew yes. so i mean he used to we still have two more years of it yep i yeah. mean <laughs> so the present is still going on yes for chris the jericho. present and somewhat future it's amazing how long he's been able to stay relevant and, and and stay entertaining for this amount of time with the way the times have changed through the attitude era through the pg era now in aew doing a little bit more um you know attitude less pg kind of stuff like it's he's definitely so versatile that it's hard to think of anybody else that we could say kind of transcends the whole past and present thing theme of our podcast absolutely well with that that wraps up our discussion about chris jericho we thank you for listening to both part one and part two of this um and again we appreciate you listening to the podcast in general please help us to grow send give us some likes spread the word to your friends help us grow this podcast we want it to be um, as successful as possible. Um, we're having a lot of fun doing this. Yep. And we hope you guys are having fun listening to it. Uh, until next time, this has been Wrestling with Wrestling's Past and Present. <laughs>